Hello and welcome to BrainX here at Ramada Kelowna. Coming up, we're going to hear from some of the most inspired thinkers in the field as they share some powerful insights into brain injury. Keith, can you hear me? I can, yeah. <laughs> So uh, Keith, as, as you know, is uh, not only a professional hockey player, but he's an advocate in helping us do what we do. We form Stop Concussions. Right now, what I want to do is I want to obviously take you to Keith. We're going to have a little bit of interview with Keith. You'll have an opportunity to ask questions. And then what I think is important, I'm going to take you through a journey, a journey that I've lived along my playing career, but also uh, after my playing career, what has gone on with the word concussion. So uh, Keith, as you know, played professionally in the uh, National Hockey League. Uh, I got to meet him many years ago uh, while I was uh, involved with an organization called Shoot for a Cure, which you see some of the brochures there. And my buddy had broken his neck well over 40 years ago. So that's how I got involved in what's called philanthropy, trying to help people that can't help themselves. So I was blessed to meet Keith because he was the spokesperson for this organization along with Jerome McGinley. And Keith, uh, unfortunately, as you heard, uh, suffered a career-ending injury. For me, one of the top power forwards of, the, uh, of, the, of our time, and uh, just not only a good friend, but somebody that's really helped me take the message to where it needs to get to, not only to you, but to you. So, Keith, thank you for not only being a friend, uh, can you describe uh, your life and uh, obviously living after uh, your playing career uh, with a concussion? I always kind of talk about my my professional career because uh, that's really where my concussion difficulties um, first showed up for me. I, I have what they call four documented concussions, but I always say that doesn't really tell the whole story. Um, I was no different than any young hockey player growing up in Canada. Uh, back in the, the 80s, uh, 70s and 80s, uh, I would get bumped on the head and I was sent back out there and, and, and I developed the mindset that, that courage was playing through that, through that, that injury or that adversity. And, and uh, um, uh, that, that led me to my first documented concussion in 1997 when I was playing for the Hartford Whalers. And um, uh, I was hit, hit center ice and there was... There was a commonality to all my concussions. It seemed to be always the same way. It was open ice hit, uh, turning one direction, taking a blindside hit to the head, uh, direct blunt trauma. And, um, uh, and in, in almost every case, not really feeling the, the effects at that particular moment, not feeling it till, till afterwards. But on my first, I, I stayed in, in, a, in a Hartford hospital overnight. Um, and at that point, I was told that uh, I wasn't allowed to participate in active sport for one full week. And I thought, Wow! The, how how novel! What a what a tremendous um, uh, advantage! Or um, you know, the, the team putting my health first, and and then only getting further into my case history and understanding that that's that's not it's not a light switch. It doesn't it doesn't go off after a certain period of time. It, it takes the brain the brain time to heal, and we all heal at different rates. And and uh, so, anyways, I, I got through my first concussion. I suffered my second concussion in uh, May of two thousand where I was taken off the ice on a stretcher in Pittsburgh in the playoffs, stayed in the Pittsburgh, ho Pittsburgh hospital overnight, um, uh, where, and then whereby I was back on the ice two nights later in the Eastern Conference Finals against the New Jersey Devils. Um, I, I'd gone through my baseline test, and I don't want to diminish the fact of baseline. Uh, I think it's very important that the children have impact baseline uh, testing or results so, that so you have a baseline to go back on. Um, but, I, but I knew what I needed to do in order to get through that test. Um, and after I, the test was administered, the, psychologist, the, the neurologist sat across the table from me and she goes, Keith, please just be very careful with what you're doing. And I kind of chuckled to myself and, and, and I said, I know what I'm doing. And I walked out and, and, and I had the worst headache I've ever had in my entire life. And I proceeded to play two nights later. And, and when people ask, I always kind of look at that moment that that synopsis in time is kind of the, turn, the beginning of the demise for me. Um, I ended up playing. I was fine. I, I healed over the summer. Uh, I suffered my third third documented concussion in, uh, in, in the spring or early spring of 2004, at which point I missed six weeks of active play. And again, I probably returned sooner than I should have. And, um, uh, and now, but now I can start to see what was happening. The, 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 um, uh, the, the, um, the, the results of each concussion were, were, were becoming different. The side effects were all different. Uh, some of them were, were consistent, the headaches, the head pressure. Um, uh, but, but a lot of times I, I have, I'd have different symptoms. I had double vision. I had uh, 
um, exercise induced lightheadedness. I had um, sensitivity to light. Um, and so there was, there, was, there, was, there was never any consistency. And that's why I always tell people as well that no two concussions are alike. When we're trying to treat them, it may take you multiple uh, practitioners or multiple uh, fields of study in order to, you know, to, to return to health. Um, uh, my final and fourth concussion was, uh, was in October 2005. Um, whereby it took me, it, it ended, it resulted in the end of my career. In 2006, I had to retire, um, but it doesn't tell the whole story. It took me seven, better part of seven years before I returned to health, and I was, and I was 100%. And, and um, uh, so, uh, it was, it was a long journey. Um, but I always tell people, you know, you know what normalcy is, and you fight to get back to that point in time. Well, uh, Keith, thank you for walking through your uh, concussion uh, history. We all know that it's a very dark injury. It's an invisible injury. As you can see, Keith uh, is in a rink uh, educating kids, uh, obviously not only to play, but also to play the game safe. And you'll hear a little bit about that in a few minutes uh, once I go through my speech. Uh, Keith, all your kids play sport actively. Are you nervous at all? I know that you've had, uh, you, now you have Caden, who's uh, actually been drafted by the Montreal Canadiens. And, uh, uh, you're in Boston right now working with him uh, along with his goalie coach, Chris Canaldi. Can you tell us, are you nervous while your children are still playing? Sure. A little, a little point of irony for you as well. Caden's drafted, drafted by the Montreal Canadiens. He attends Northeastern University in Boston, and we're actually he was actually practicing at the Boston Bruins practice, practice facility. <laughs> so a <laughs> little point of irony for you. But... Um, um, you, you know, um, my, I have a 20 year old as well who just finished his, you know, finished his junior career. He's, he's scheduled to go into Nebraska Omaha in the fall. Um, and, and he's had, he himself has had three documented concussions. Um, but the way we treat his injuries today were, are so much different than the way we treated my injuries back in the day. Each and every time we made sure he returned to health. Not only did he pass his baseline, he had to pass cognitive testing. He had to, you know, he had to be, he had to be a certain period of time symptom free before we'd even allow him back on the ice back in school to even you know go back to class uh back to uh pr practice before he could even think about playing in a game and and uh and so you know he's, he's had a couple that that you know forced him out of the lineup for three four weeks um but i still feel very comfortable because i feel like we've managed the injury the right way um and if we hadn't we put him into that into that that window of second concussion impact or second impact syndrome, things might be a little different. Um, and then I have a daughter who played field lacrosse at Villanova University, uh, who only had two documented concussions, wasn't able to recover from her second, and ultimately was forced to, to stop playing the game that she loved. And a totally different situation, but a situation that you know inevitably occurred, and we had to manage. And the way to manage it for her was to stop playing. But when they were growing up, I, I never had any, I, I never felt as though I was putting them at risk. You know, we all want our children to enjoy their childhood. We all want them to love and, and enjoy what they do. And, and I felt that, that that's what I was doing, even though it's, you know, some of them were contact sports, active sports. Um, to me, it all, it's all about the education, making ourselves aware and managing the injury the right way when it does happen. You know, you mentioned Kylie, of course. I remember you telling me you were driving in the car once after her concussion. She actually asked you, is it part of our family? Is it our DNA? Is it our genetics? <laughs> and because I just wanted to mention your brother, Wayne, who also was a, a phenomenal ice hockey player. Uh, uh, he played well over 14 years. He also sustained concussions uh, through his career. So when she asked you that question, what did you say? So, so my answer to her was, I, 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 can't, re I can't really answer the, I can't, can't answer the question honestly i don't believe there's a you know there's a genetic or or uh, predetermined risk you know risk factor involved and just go out there and enjoy it and love love the game that you play and and um if something happens we'll we'll we'll, we'll, we'll treat it and we'll manage it the way it needs to be treated but but don't don't get sidetracked by um possibility of injury and contact sport there's an inherent risk there is but um the more we educate ourselves the more our parents, our, our, our physicians, our coaches, our trainers understand, um, you know, the, the severity and, and the ramifications, then we can, we can protect our children better. 
Well, you know, concussions are very serious. We take it very serious. Uh, people that know Keith and I, we've been uh, doing this for a long time. We always want to add a little levity to it because uh, we know that you were uh, one of those big power forwards. I want to bring you back to a, you know, we talked about how concussions can be caused in sport by big hits, also by fighting, the bare fist fighting. Uh, does anybody remember uh, Keith uh, and his brother having a little bit of a spat on the ice? Anybody remember that? Keith, can you get, I know it's, we don't want to take too much of your time, but can you just give us that uh, when big brother and little brother met for the first, I think it was the first time you guys met, I think you were in Hartford and he was in Buffalo, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so, so that was, that was news for about a week after it happened. And, and then uh, it kind of went away until somebody invented a thing called YouTube. And now it's the first, first question. It's the first question I'm asked uh, almost every time I, uh, I, I speak, but um, I, in my own kind of twisted way, it was it was my own my own way of seeing if if he was you know if he was ready to stack up and if he was ready to protect himself. So uh, we were playing in a, a, a game late in the season. Uh, he was in, he'd just been called up from Rochester. He was playing with Buffalo. Um, he actually offered to fly my parents in for the game, and they were like, "No, we'll just stay here. We've, we've got the satellite dish. We can we can watch it at home." And uh, um, so we're, we're fighting for a playoff spot. They're already in a playoff spot. They had players like Dominic Hasher and uh, Michael Pekka. So they, they were they were they were in pretty good spot. And, uh, he actually kind of bumped in, ran to, ran into our goaltender at the time, Sean Burke. And there was a big melee at the front of the net. Uh, the pile moved to the corner, and and then a, a fight broke out on the other side of the ice. And, uh, and it was just Wayne, myself, and a player named Bob Boogner, who's the head coach of the Florida Panthers now. And he looked, he, he looked at us and he goes, okay, no fighting. And he goes, oh, you won't, you're brothers. So he skated away. And the building, the, the building started to chant. We were down 2 nothing. It's the end of the second period. I'm like, you know, maybe, maybe a you know, good fight here would, would, would get the bench excited, the fans excited. So I asked him if he wanted to go. And I thought he would say no. And he said, I don't care. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we ended up, it was, more, it was more of a noogie fest than, than it was an actual fight. But... Um, but uh, I did hit him with one, and, and then right at that moment, I, I knew it was the wrong thing to do. And so I, again, it was toward the end of the period, so I skated off the ice. I went right down the tunnel. I had my equipment all on still. I walk in the trainer's room. I pick up the phone. I call the house, and my dad answers the phone. And my dad's laughing. And, and he's, I'm like, I'm sorry. It shouldn't have happened. He's like, no, it's part of the game. I understand. And in the background, I hear my mom and my sister, my younger sister, going, it's not okay. You're older. You should have known better. <laughs> <laughs> So safe to say, I still get in trouble, and Wayne still claims that he won the fight. Now, I have heard both sides of the story, and he did, uh, Wayne did throw an uppercut and just missed you. He said he would knock you out, so... Uh, he he would have uh, hurt me, for sure. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Now, final question to you, because I know you're really busy. We want, uh, some people want to maybe ask you some questions. Is the NHL, let's not talk about specifically the NHL, but is sport, all leagues, all associations, whether they're pros or whether they're amateur uh, associations, are we all doing enough to protect our kids uh, against this injury? Well, I'll draw, I'll draw on my experience with the National Hockey League first. Um, you know, I was called up to the league offices uh, several years ago. Brendan Shanahan took over player safety and, and he asked me, what, what do we need to do to protect their players? And I said, you, you, need, to, you need to stop all hits to the head, whatever that, whatever, whatever that means. If, 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 it's, if, it's, if it's intentional, if it's by accident, there's, there's, a, there's a ramification for your actions. And if, if you take away contact to the head, that, that immediately nullifies a large percentage of the injury. Um, and, and so I felt as though that at least they were listening. Because when, when he came out with his protocol, um, uh, I felt that it, was, it had some of the talking points that I had, gave, I had given to him. And, and so I felt like they were doing something. But now, uh, you know, there, there's a lawsuit against the league. Um, I'm not personally involved with that lawsuit. Um, and, the, and the league, and I get it, it's a business. They're, they're, they're hiding behind the fact that if, they, if there's an, ad, an admission that they're going to be culpable, they're going to be liable to some, to some degree. And, and, but to say that there's no correlation is, is disturbing is disturbing and to me that sets us back in time um so i'm indifferent on the on the national hockey league let's say um other sports national football league i'm good friends with chris nowinski who's done a great job with the Leg concussion legacy foundation out of boston um i'm not sure if people there are aware of the brain bank that he's, he's established i believe there's one in canada now as well um but uh, you know, Kerry, you spend a lot of time in uh, in the South Pacific, you know, where there's a lot of rugby and, 
and uh, and Australian Rules football, and, and they're they're millennials, behind, they're, they're decades behind where we are today in North America. But with that all being said, we still have a long way to go, and and uh, continued research, uh, continued education, um, and continued awareness goes a long way to you know to, to getting us uh, to where we need. And again, I, I would just say that you know Carrie and I have never claimed to be. Uh, um, medical professionals. We're, we're just speaking from personal experience, uh, and we want to see things change at the grassroots level. It definitely helps if there's a trickle down from the from the highest level and the professional levels, um, but we know that's not always the case. And so it's important as parents, as as, as uh, um, practitioners, that, that we educate ourselves and and you know we work to to find to make a difference. Well, Keith, uh, we thank you very much. Uh, before we let you go, uh, are there any questions? Maybe we have a couple questions. If anybody wants to ask one, put their hand up. Anything about, yeah, can you want to stand up? Fire it out. So I'll answer the first question, the, first, the second question first, because I could, because I, I could hear it. And Gucci, if you can repeat first, but the answer to the second question is, uh, um, <laughs> I'm a little indifferent on, on my answer. Again, I hate to say, but I, I was, I firmly believe that that when kids, especially in the game of hockey, when they learn to make contact at a young age, it becomes just a part of the game. It, they don't go out of their way. I found when they first transition to the older age, that that it be, it, the testosterone, the puberty, the um, you know the size difference created this environment where kids wanted to you know they wanted to sh you know to, sh to show their masculinity or 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 their ability to you know to run over somebody or, or hit like they do in the pros and and so that was my only concern. But when we're talking about the development of the brain, the longer they can the longer we can go or the longer they can go without traumatizing the brain, the better chance they have of uh, of I'm not running into those problems, if, if, you know, if, if later on in life. So there's certainly an argument for let's how how far can we push out of contact? I, I was sitting with somebody yesterday who, who's who, his son plays hockey and is, he now wants to play football, and he's like he can play tag football, but he's not he's not playing any contact. And, and the, in the NFL, the pros they 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 have they, they don't have contact until the end of the week. They've even taken it out of their practices. They can't have contact. So. Um, there's something to be said for protecting the brain as long as we can. And then the first part, Gooch, I didn't hear the first part. Can you repeat? Can, can you, you repeat, repeat the, the first, first part? part of your question, please? He forgot. <laughs> Sorry about that. Sorry. You ramble. Sorry about that. When you come back, yeah, stand up, please. That's all right. Yep, absolutely. Keith, the question is, uh, obviously, you mentioned something that's really important, and there may be some people in the room that uh, didn't pick up on it. Uh, we, we become a new normal. We don't actually come back to where we think we were before. So the question was, uh, when did you do your most healing? You know, you had one, two, three, four uh, concussions. And I, I know I was with you for many of those years. It took roughly seven years for you to get back to where you felt you had a new normal. So. What, when was the? When did you notice you were actually starting to heal? Yeah, and that's a, that's a that's a great question. Actually, um, um, where I correlate, where I didn't feel normal was concussion. Documented concussion three. Um, it took. It was a longer time to to heal. I didn't feel as though I entirely healed. Um, following that concussion, before I put myself in, and I had the benefit of a lo the lockout, the National Hockey League players lockout um, in 2004. So I had an entire season in order in order to recover, and I thought I was in a good spot. And, and 
when I received when I when I got hit for do documented concussion number four, it w I was actually relieved because I was like, okay, I, I, I took my first big hit, and and I. I I was on the phone on the bus afterwards, calling my parents, calling my wife, telling them, I think I'm okay. I think I'm good. I think, you know, I got through that hit. I, I'm, I'm going to be okay. Only to have 24, 48 hours later, start to see the, 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 the symptoms re reappear. And, and, uh, and so I also should correct. It was, it was, a, it was, um, I, I misspoke when I said after documented concussion four, that it took me seven years to get to hundred percent. I don't think I'll ever be hundred percent again. I, I'm as close to 100% as I can get, but but I'll always know that I've you know I've, I've injured my brain. Um, doesn't keep me from doing the things I love to do. It allows me to do almost everything that I did before. I, I, I can't work out the same way because uh, I get this exercise-induced fatigue. Um, but um, there's always a part of me that'll know that you know that I've injured my brain. I know it every time I talk to you. Um, do you want to do you want to stand up, please? Did you get that? I didn't. I already forgot it. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, the question, please, uh, if the question that I understood is, uh, you talked about your healing. What were some of those uh, elements that allowed you to heal? Uh, was it vis uh, vestibular issues, uh, augular issues, anything that you felt was helping you? I know you tried almost everything uh, with, the, with the doctors, so the, the, yeah. the lady would like yeah, to know. Yeah, another great question. And, and um, my, my last and final documented concussion, which was the worst for me, with symptoms include not only not only head, headaches and head pressure, but um, uh, light sensitivity, um, double vision, uh, exercise-induced lightheadedness, exercise-induced fatigue, um, and then I also felt that they weren't symptoms of my concussion so much as a byproduct it was the emotional gamut that I went through, um, the anger, frustration, um, sadness, um, and so. Uh, I did. I, I, you know, I was obviously I was fortunate enough to be afforded the ability to see whoever I wanted to see, and they, they flew me all over the country. I was seeing top neurologists uh, um, all over North America, but I also did non-conventional um, uh, treatments as well. It's right from acupuncture to Reiki to um, a, a, to, to massage therapy to vestibular therapy. Um, all with varying degrees, and what I found was I would in, I would improve with some of those things. I would improve um, and then hit a plateau, and I couldn't get over that hump. Um, what ended up being probably the saving grace for me was about four years in to my final concussion, and some of my teammates had, had done a treatment called prolotherapy, and prolotherapy is a uh, it's prolotherapy or PRP, uh, and it's a light prolotherapy is a lidocaine dextrose injection up and down your cervical lumbar spine not obviously uh, very invasive, non-conventional, um, that I had tremendous success with. And I've, I've turned to some other people onto that and they've had success, some haven't. Um, but that was, that was, you know, probably what I had the most success with. And then I've had some success also with, with a chiropractic manipulation called Atlas Orthogenal, um, more recent as I, as I had some symptoms recur in the last couple of years. Um, but, um, you know, uh, Again, varying degrees of success, always hitting a plateau un until until the prolotherapy for me. All right, we'll uh, take one last. Did that answer the question enough? Okay, one last question uh, back, please. Yeah. I'm sorry? Yeah, come on up. <laughs> Test, check, check. Does that mic work there, bud? Beautiful. You're loud. Keith, I think we're going to do some karaoke right now. I'm not sure. Hang on. All right, I'll just go up. Oh, there, that's okay. Hello. <laughs> All right, congratulations to both of you for all of your successes. My question has to do with culture. So I've heard what your dad said, I've heard what both of you said about it's just the game. It's 
it's the nature of the game. And so I want to know how does culture need to change in hockey and in contact sport in order to make health improvements? So, so for me, and I don't know if Carrie's answer would be different, but for, for me, wh when somebody asks me about culture, my, my answer to them is the culture that I grew up in, the culture that I played in was courage or bravery was going back out there, no matter, you know, facing the adversity, fighting through injury. And, and today, the culture is or should be real courage is having the ability to speak up and say, I don't feel well, I, I don't feel right, I, I need help. And somebody listening to that. And, and that to me is the, the biggest cultural shift, especially at the grassroots level, that it was, it, it, it's still only, and, and I, I don't think it happens near as much. It might still, if, if it does, that it, sh it should be an embarrassing moment for a parent when a player gets injured in competition and the coach says, you're done playing. You, you have to sit out until, you, until we find out, evaluate you, make sure that you're okay. And the parent saying, he's fine, putting him back out in, on the ice, on the field, on the, on the court, whatever it is, whatever sport they're playing, and, and, and not taking the, the injury, injury seriously. And, and that's, to me, that's, that's the cultural change. That's the cultural shift that, if it hasn't occurred, has to take place. And, and again, I think in a lot of situations, a lot of cases, it has. Um, and, and if it hasn't, it's, it should be an embarrassing moment for those that, that don't get it. Okay, one last question. I know you wanted to ask again. Yep. <laughs> hey, hey. Uh, you noticed that the question was Mr. Primo. Did we lose him? Oh, Keith. Yeah. Um, who's going to win tonight? Oh, <laughs> um, uh, I'm, I'm going <laughs> to I'm, I'm go All with right, Washington. next question. I, I'm, uh, it, it, um, it, it's, uh, I'm, I'm excited for Washington. I, I, you know, like I played with Gerard Gallant. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I was excited for him. Um, but Washington, it's been a long time. I know Vancouver fans are, are, are starving for a, for a championship there as well. And, and they, they've got a great player coming in. He played the end of the year there. He plays with my son at Northeastern, Adam Goddett. And, and uh, so they've got, they've got a bright future too with, with some of their young players that are coming in. All right, yeah. All right, Keith, uh, I know that uh, you told us you only had 15 minutes. As usual, you out rambled me, you went to 30. Uh, we want to thank you very much. I know uh, most of the uh, people here appreciated uh, learning a little bit about not only yourself and your struggles and trials and tribulations, but also giving us a perspective as being a father, having uh, your kids playing, and also helping us understand what it takes to get back. So I, I appreciate the time you always give us uh, as a co-founder. With you for stop concussions can't thank you enough for what you do to help us do what we do so thank you thanks guys thank you well well i hope you enjoyed that uh, keith uh, Keith's a very, very busy man. Um, he is involved not only with hockey, but he's involved with many charities. And when Keith and I met, uh, we met uh, working with Shoot for a Cure, and um, we have became, well, I'm a little older than him, so I guess I'm the older brother, and uh, certainly I would not drop the gloves with him, so uh, I want to thank him a lot. Now, uh, my, I, I wanted to share my journey and my journey is a lot of guys journey a lot of men and women have gone through what i've gone i'm fortunate because i can stand up in front of you and actually talk about it a lot of people can't so i want to share it with that and i know there's a lot of medical people here uh whether you're from being a doctor a nurse a physiotherapist whatever walk of life you're in my story is what you need to look for now i know i'm new with this thing i'm not very good with uh, modern technology So I, I know they, you, it was mentioned uh, about my career and that sort of stuff. I just wanted, you know, was, that was uh, about 30 years ago when I was young and dapper. Um, I, I, like any young boy, 
wanted to play in the National Hockey League. It was a dream of mine. I came through the Winnipeg Jets organization, 1979. Some of you are not old enough, but some will. Remember the days of the World Hockey Association with Bobby Hall and Anders Hedberg and Olf Nielsen. And I was coming up right after that. In my draft year, um, I, I just wasn't, I knew I was talented enough, but I just wasn't tough enough. And I never knew what that word meant. So I got an opportunity to, to, to go through the Winnipeg Jets uh, pre-rookie camp. It was through a guy named Fran Huck, uh, because I didn't get drafted. I got to go to this camp, which was a two-day camp in Winnipeg uh, Arena. And it wasn't a camp, it was a blood fest. If you remember back in 1978, 79, uh, the Broad Street Bullies uh, were Keith uh, with the Philadelphia Flyers. Uh, it was a mess. I was beaten up, blood, guts, I lost a couple of teeth in a fight. Uh, I, I didn't know how to fight. I, I thought hockey was about playing and, and showing your talent. Uh, Two days later, I got called in to the office, and it was the general manager at the time. The Winnipeg Jets were moving from the WHA days into the National Hockey League again, uh, and I sat in front of John Ferguson Sr. Uh, for any of you, though, or any Montreal Canadian fans, John Ferguson Sr. was arguably one of the toughest hockey players of all times, and here I am at 18 years old looking at him, and he's looking at me and saying, Mr. Goulet, called me Mr., and he said, um, you're talented, but you're just not tough enough. And I left that room thinking, wow, I almost made it. My dream's over. Like any young boy, I was discouraged. And I started thinking, tough, what is tough? What does that mean? How do you get tough? I never got the chance to become tough because I never made it to the National Hockey League. Years later, I got an opportunity to go over to Europe, and that's where I had an opportunity to play 16 years. And I learned what tough was. Tough wasn't how f much you could fight, or who you could beat up, or who you could run over. Tough was being able to compete at a high level and having pressure every night to perform. Because when I played in Europe, it was different than playing in the National Hockey League. There are four lines of very quality people. When I played in Europe, you, as, you and one other import were the show. If you didn't produce, you were going home. So it'd be like you going to your job every day and your boss looking at you saying, you're not doing so well today. You know what? You're gone. We're bringing the next one in. So I learned what tough was. Tough was the ability to rise above the challenges that you have. Um, I'm not quite as articulate as Keith. Uh, Keith actually went to university. I got through grade 12 by passing it grade 6 twice. So... <laughs> I don't know why you're laughing, because it's not a joke. Um, so I wanted, to, I wanted to share something with you that a lot of people wouldn't share, because I think it's important to, to understand the book, the cover, is not what's inside sometimes. First, I want to thank uh, the Brain Trust uh, Canada, along with uh, Magna, and your great entire team. for putting this event on. Uh, last night, uh, Magna was so great in, in offering me to come and golf and, and, and see your beautiful city. First time for me in Kelowna, believe it or not. Heard a lot of great things about it. And um, unfortunately, I've had some challenges this week that, uh, that, that require me to take care of. So I was on a flight last night to come in here about 9 o'clock at night. Uh, that changed. Uh, I then had to take a later flight. Uh, it changed. And my final flight left at, I think, 11.30. And I slept at the uh, Calgary airport for a couple of hours. And while I was there, I actually decided I better put some stuff on paper because I didn't want to make a fool of myself. So please bear with me. I, I am going to have to read some things uh, because I did arrive here, I think, at 7 o'clock. And uh, Maggie, you're so gracious to make sure coffee was hot and the room was ready. So. So I want to thank you. It's it, I, Doing events around the world, it's always difficult, but look at this turnout. People are here because of you and your great organization. Thank you for doing that. I'd be remiss if I didn't also thank all of you for taking time out. Your dedication and passion towards this injury of helping others that can't help themselves is so vital. Don't take anything for granted, whether you're the neurologist at, at the hospital, or you're a nurse working on the floor, or you're a physiotherapist, or you're a player, a parent, a coach, a mother, a father, a grandfather, a granddaughter, grandson. Don't take it for granted. We need to help those that can't help themselves. And that's why you're here today, to educate yourself a little bit. I'm not going to give you the medical components of this, because I certainly can't do that. But I've lived it. It's absolutely an honor that I could be with you
be with you here today because um, I shouldn't be here today. I should actually be at home taking care of some things that were very important to me. Uh, I won't explain all the, the, the stuff, but because of Magna and her passion towards making sure that I was here, uh, I jumped on a plane uh, and I will have to, right after this, fly back to Toronto, take care of some things. But I wanted to share with you a journey. You saw me earlier uh, playing hockey. This is a picture that I found when Keith and I wrote a book. Um, I was sent this picture. I never saw it in my life until it was presented to me about 10 years ago. And if you could see the picture, I apologize because I can't see everything. Make sure it's the right picture. Um, if you can see up close, you'll see that I'm on the ground, on the ice. My eyes are open, they're glossed. I'm out. I don't remember that particular situation. But what I do remember is, once I was pulled up to the top of the, and with the, the gentleman on the left, he says, hey, Cooch, where are you? And of course, a couple guys skate around with sticks. I knew automatically where I was. I was at a hockey game. So I said, hey, I'm at a hockey game. He said, great, come on back to the bench. Get to the bench. I'm the player coach of this third division team. Um, takes out a couple smelling salts. Here I go. I didn't miss a shift. I played, continued on playing. And as I went through this journey, it ended up that back in September 16th, 1988, I would end up suffering three severe concussions. And in those days, it was, your bell was rung. And we learned that having your bell rung meant you had to perform even harder. So I would never miss a game. Unless I had a cast, something was broken, I would be playing. Because I owed it to my team mates. I owed it to the management that paid my salary. I owed it to my mom and dad who drove me every morning to practice at six or seven o'clock in the morning. I owed it to them. What I didn't realize after my third severe concussion that I would be led down a path of darkness. If there's anybody in the room that's had either a brain injury or a concussion, it's the darkness. It's the no light at the end of the tunnel that draws you into this depression, this anxiety, the scaredness. But mine took me down of thoughts of suicide, thoughts of not wanting to live anymore because I just couldn't have the answers. I couldn't solve it. Four months ago, I moved, and um, while I was cleaning out my stuff and packing up some of the old artifacts, I found a letter that I wrote in 1991. I've never shared this with anybody other than my wife. Um, it's a letter that I wrote to the doctor. When I went through my serious issues in Germany, they flew me back home to Canada. I was in Winnipeg, Manitoba. At the time, they sent me to a doctor, family doctor, he had diagnosed me with anxiety. I was 30 years old, I had everything. Other than playing National Hockey League, I had money, cars, parties, everything a guy could want. I thought I had everything. And the doctor looked at me and said, you know what, you're going through anxiety. I, I think we gotta get you to a psychiatrist. So he sent me off to a psychiatrist. And as I'm sitting in front of the psychiatrist, he says, you know what, I, I think you're uh, struggling with depression. So I want to put you in this clinic for a couple of days, and let's see how you do. So they put me in, a, it was what was termed at those days a psychiatric ward for two days, and uh, they popped a pill into me, and I struggled. That summer, it was so dark, and I looked at knives and thought I didn't want to be here anymore. But somehow, along the way, with the good people that were around me, they kept me going. And they got me so well over that summer that I was allowed to go back and finish my playing career. This is at 30, I got to play till 41. And it was only that group of people that knew nothing about my depression, my concussions, or anything. They just knew how to prop me up and make sure I wanted to live. And so when I wrote this letter back to the doctor thanking him for all the things that he did, uh, outside of putting me on this drug that numbed me. I don't remember the first month being back in Germany. I got to read this thing and I say, man, thank you for allowing me to be here today to talk you through what I've been through. 
what inspired me was the fact that I was able to uh, go to the Mayo Clinic in 2010, where some of the top neurologists around the world were there. Dr. Robert Cantu, you may have heard some of these names, Dr. Mickey Collins, Dr. Bob Stern, and our own Dr. Charles Tatter. And at this event in 2010, I heard them all say the same thing. This will be the biggest challenge sport has ever had. They also concluded at the time the medical system was not ready for it. And we see that today. We don't really understand it. The brain is so complex, we just can't put a handle on it yet. So we have to look outwards. And so why Keith and I started Stop Concussions is we had to do it from the inside out. We had to help the medical world understand why we do what we do. Why does an athlete continue on playing on a broken leg? Why does an athlete continue on playing when he's taken a slap shot or she's taken a slap shot and six teeth are knocked out and 60 stitches put in their lip and yet they continue on playing? Why do we do that? It's because we were taught that. We were taught never to give up. Win at all cost. Play through the pain. Suck it up. You owe it to your teammates. I hear stories every single day about this injury and how it's mistreated. I hear stories about suicide thoughts. I see people with early onset of dementia that are friends of mine. Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, in sports, or even from car accidents or falls. I receive 10 to 15 emails a month from desperate athletes or parents who are concerned about the situation of their child. Well, today that changes. The reason it changes is because you're here in a room to understand that we as athletes think concussions is a sexy word for brain injury. A conky today, a lot of the young kids say conky. I was speaking at a, a university a couple of weeks ago. A kid may have been 21 years old. I asked the question, how many people in this room have had a concussion? And he was like, man, he was going like this. He had his hand up. I said, hey, how many do you have? 14 conkies. I said, excuse me, I don't, conkies? I don't understand that word. It's a concussion. I'm tough. 14. So we, as a society, have to change the culture. Change the mindset, not the games. Keith said that earlier. Let's not look at the sport the way it is before. Let's look at what it needs to be today. Because of the Brain Trust Canada, Shoot for a Cure and Stop Concussions, we're able to meet people like you and talk about the cause, effect, and consequence of this injury. Without people like Magna and yourselves, we cannot battle against this injury. We don't understand it. We need to educate ourselves on it. It's not in a textbook. It's not online. It's with inside ourselves. So I applaud you and your efforts today to help us make a difference in this small epidemic. And it is an epidemic. There are hundreds and thousands of people walking around on the streets today with a concussion. We pass judgment many times on them, mental illness. Is the mental illness caused by the fact that we damaged our brains? Is the addiction and the drugs and the alcohol a creation of us damaging our brains at a young youth? I believe it is. I've lived it. I'm blessed that I wasn't, I didn't go down a path of alcohol and drugs. I just lost a friend a couple weeks ago. Unbelievable hockey player, one of my best buds. He couldn't, he just couldn't. Couldn't give up taking the drugs that took away that pain. Anybody see the movie Concussion? Will Smith? Anybody remember the scene where Webster was stabbing himself with a stun gun? Anybody understand why he was doing that? Was it mental illness? No, because he wanted to take the pain that was inside of his brain and put it somewhere else for a few minutes so that it would distract him from it. This is why Keith and I developed Stop Concussions, a platform to educate, to teach all of us that we must protect ourselves from ourselves. We as athletes, and I'm sure there are a lot of you in here that are athletes, whether you're a weekend warrior or you played professionally or you played junior or you played flag football, no matter what, we are still athletes. And we all, I'm hurrying, and we all make sure that we play. 
As the adults in this picture, all of us together, our goal is to help educate coaches, trainers, administrators, and athletes about the cause, effect, and consequences, and most importantly now, the management of the concussion. The problem is that we have so many different variances of people believing that uh, it's this, it's that, it's black, it's white. There is no black and white in this picture. There's a lot of gray. So we need to work together and understand, again, all disciplines, not just neurology, but uh, specialists in algular deficiencies, in uh, other areas of maybe it's chiropractic. We all have to work together and resolve this. We must protect the one most important thing that God has given us, and it's our child's brain. This is not the boogeyman. We do not need to be scared of it. We must understand it, embrace it, embrace the education, and learn how to better protect our athletes and our children. Keith and I are very fortunate, as I mentioned to you, who would have thought I would have wrote a book? Uh, cheapest plug here. Keith and I actually wrote a book, and it was about that inside-out approach. It was all about the athlete telling the medical world, hey guys, this is why we do it. This is why we go through the, the, the trials and tribulations that we do. And I put this book out with Keith, Keith in 2011, and I cannot tell you how many people commented on it because it was a personal opinion. It was a personal story. We all have a journey. We all have a personal story. But what we have to remember is make sure when you see somebody that's suffering, whether from mental illness, a brain injury, a concussion, that you go inside and not just look at the outside. We can no longer accept the win-at-all-cost attitude that we've had for so many years. Suck it up, it ain't broke. Concussions are real and they're all around us. We're all together in this journey with concussions and collectively, we can beat this. As doctors, as therapists, as parents, or players, we can now look concussions in the eye and say, not today. Not today will you take away one of our young players one of our young people that are our future, that was mentioned earlier. Hey, my time's done. I'll never play again. I miss it every single day. So our mission today, along with Keith, is to make sure your children, your grandchildren, get to experience the greatest game on the planet, from my standpoint. If it's not hockey, it's football. If it's not football, it's soccer. If it's not soccer, it's tennis. Play is a part of our life. It teaches us the intangibles that we need to be able to sit in a room and meet people and talk. We need to educate ourselves today, understand what we need to do. We all have a role in it, whether it's big or small. The medical world needs to join with us, athletes around the world, and work together. Forget the lawsuits. I hope there's no lawyers in the room. I hate it that the National Hockey League is being sued by their players, that the National Football League is being sued by their players. Why? They played for your organization. They're damaged. You should take care of them. There shouldn't be a lawsuit. It should be, we've made a mistake, we understand what our path was, I will step up and say, I will help. Instead of wasting money, Again, sorry if there's any lawyers. Wasting money in the courtroom because those young men and women need our help now, not 20 years from today. Very important that if you lead, take anything from me today, concussions do not know age, nor gender, nor activity, nor skill. And they do not take weekends off. So nor can we. We can't put a Band-Aid on this. There's not a piece of equipment. And wearing helmets is very important, no question. But what's really important is that we understand that a helmet will not, let me underline that, will not prevent a concussion. What it will do is, is what it was designed for. It was designed to make sure we didn't have lacerations or bro breaks to the skull. They do it very well. Mouth guards, to this day, there's no evidence that it protect, or prevents a concussion. It may mitigate some of the, 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 the risk or the intensity, but it was built 
to protect your teeth. The only thing that will protect your brain is the brain itself. Understand your whereabouts. Understand the atmosphere. Understand where you are at all times when you're playing sport or even in a car. Don't be distracted. Don't let your child go to a hockey game in the back of a car playing a video game and then expect them after they've watched uh, you know, some of these different type of games. I don't have children, so I don't know all the names of these things, but if they run out of the car, get their bag of equipment, put it on, and now they're a gladiator. Have your children prepared. Have yourself prepared before they play. Talk to your children. Explain the risks. In closing, it's through education and education and education. Those are the things that are going to help us battle this very dark injury. 40 years ago, um, Another one of my good friends, uh, who was my line mate, broke his neck um, and was uh, left as a quad. And at a young age, I learned very quickly that life can change in an instant. And so through his trials and tribulations, it allowed me to give back. Robert laid in a hospital bed up until four years ago when we lost him and uh, never complained. Couldn't move anything below the neck. And he was living in Winnipeg and I had moved back, uh, obviously I'd played hockey in Europe and then decided I'd move to Toronto. Every summer I'd go and see him a couple times a year after I got back from my hockey days. And every time I came in there, big smile on his face. Always happy. One day we were sitting around chatting and um, he was on the life, uh, he had, uh, sorry, I don't know what it's called, but he had What's it called? Trig. Trig and thank you. What, what's it called? Trig. trig. A trig. And uh, I'd flown in from Toronto, and this was about three years into it, and he didn't look very happy. He didn't say a word, and I looked at him, and I looked at him again, and out came the words from me. Robbie, I can't do it. Not one word was spoken, but I knew what he wanted me to do. I knew he wanted to end it. I knew he wanted me to pull the plug. There's no way I could do it standing there listening to silence, but knowing he was asking me to do that. A couple minutes into this very surreal, I get goosebumps even talking about it, the nurse walks into the room, and as she walked into the room, I looked down, and Robert had unfortunately lost his bowel movement, and it ended up on my shoes. And as I looked down, and I looked up, I said, Robert, he just pooped on me. Tears on my eyes, tears on his eyes, the nurse, tears, and then all of a sudden the three of us just started laughing. And we couldn't stop laughing. And from that moment on, it was a bond like no other bond. That he allowed me to understand why this happened. When I lost Robert, I was asked to fly back and do the eulogy. And I'm going to leave you with this. And these are very, very important words that you can take with you and make sure you have everyone understand them and live by them. I wrote a big long speech, a little bit longer than I have here today. I'm on the plane flying. It's starting to sound really typical. I get into the uh, church. There's probably the same amount of people and it's all my colleagues that I, or my teammates, some of them I hadn't seen in 30 years and you think I'm nervous now, just think about standing in front of your friends and seeing them all naked. Um, <laughs> and having to deliver this eulogy. So I had my papers and I was, I'd been in game sevens where I've won and lost. So I was even more nervous and I was kind of shaking. I looked up and I saw one of my buddies I hadn't seen for a long time. And he had his little uh, son beside him. And it allowed me to focus on that young boy. And I said, you know what, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I wrote a speech like no other speech, but I'm gonna leave it right here and I'm gonna tell you, I had to think of why Robert came into my life. And these are the words that I came up with at that time. What did he teach me? A boy that had had his life taken away from him 
by a foolish decision. He was down in Grand Forks, if you know Winnipeg, and just over the border back in 1977. Boys were going down to have uh, a weekend at one of the university spots, drinking hole. And Robert had signed a three-year deal to play in Nice, France. And so after his first year playing on the Mediterranean, pretty cool place to play ice hockey or hockey, the owner of the club came to him and said, listen, Robert, you know what? Is there any possible way that you can stay over the summer? You know, I own this, this, uh, this rental company on the beach. It rents surfboards and all that sort of stuff. And Robert said, you know what? I can't do it this year. My summers are for my friends. My summers for my family, you know what? And my summers are for my teammates. So I want to go home and I want to really enjoy this summer because it was my first, his first year playing professional sport. He came home. Everybody decided on this particular weekend we were going to go down and have a few cocktails and a few cheap draft draft beer. In those days, some of you would probably not remember, but it was like five cents a glass. I unfortunately couldn't, fortunately or unfortunately, I couldn't go that weekend. I had uh, a family commitment. They all went down there. Robert, at midnight after consuming enormous amounts of alcohol, decided as he was walking to his room in the Holiday Inn, decided, you know what? I need to swim. As we've heard before, kicks open the door, runs in dives in, and unfortunately, it was the wrong end of the pool. After fracturing his third and fourth vertebrae, he was left, as I mentioned to you, as a quad, and his life had changed. My life had changed. All of our lives had changed. And so what I learned from that moment, and that's what we need to do now, is whether you're a doctor, a lawyer, a newspaper deliverer, a mailman, it's not what you collect along your journey, scoring championships, money, houses, land, entitlement, Mr., Mrs., King or Queen, the scoring races, the trophies, the rings. It's what you give back is your legacy. And today, that's what you've done. You've taken time, and you'll learn from a lot of great professionals here. I noticed the room in there. Take time. Just don't pay this a courtesy. Just don't walk around the room. Talk. Meet. In this day in society, everybody's LOL, WTF, and all those other crazy things. Take time to talk. Throw these away for a half an hour. I'd go crazy if I did, but take a few minutes. So on behalf of Stop Concussions, Keith Primo, and all our great ambassadors, and all the friends that I've lost along the way, and some of the friends that you've lost along the way, we thank you. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts to help those that can't help themselves. And on top of that, Stop Concussions would like to donate $1,000 to the, this, the lovely lady that was just up here talking about helmets, and where, I'm sorry, I apologize. What, what's her name? Is she here? Yeah, Chief. Is she here? All right, well then, that's who wants a thousand bucks. So on behalf, on behalf of Stop Concussions, uh, we would like to make a donation towards uh, that fine program uh, because we know how important it is. Again, it's not just about having helmets, it's about what's inside the helmet that's important. And we'll help educate, we'll send some of our information that can help your young boys and girls learn about uh, the cause, effect, and consequences of, of uh, concussions. All right, the hook's here. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. That's all from us here at the Brain X Symposium. If you'd like more information on any of today's topics, you can head over to Brain Trust Canada's website. I'm your host, Lucy Hazelwood. Until next time, this is Shore TV.